We do hope that you enjoy hearing this special audio book presentation and that it will help to light your pathway in life. Please feel free to share this audio book with friends and loved ones. This is for educational purposes only. Chapter 7 The Consistency of the Kingdom The creative power of both God and His creations is limitless, but they are not in reciprocal relationship. You do communicate fully with God, as He does with you. This is an ongoing process in which you share, and because you share it, you are inspired to create like God. Yet in creation you are not in reciprocal relation to God, since He created you, but you did not create Him. We have already said that only in this respect your creative power differs from his. Even in this world there is a parallel. Parents give birth to children, but children do not give birth to parents. They do, however, give birth to their children and thus give birth as their parents do. If you created God and he created you, the kingdom could not increase through its own creative thought. Creation would therefore be limited and you would not be co-creators with God. As God's creative thought proceeds from him to you, so must your creative thought proceed from you to your creations. Only in this way can all creative power extend outward. God's accomplishments are not yours. But yours are like his. He created the sonship, and you increase it. You have the power to add to the kingdom, but not to add to the creator of the kingdom. You claim this power when you become vigilant only for God and his kingdom. By accepting this power as yours, you have learned to be what you are. Your creations belong in you, as you belong in God. You are part of God, as your sons are part of his sons. To create is to love. Love extends outward simply because it cannot be contained. Being limitless, it does not stop. It creates forever, but not in time. God's creations have always been, because he has always been. Your creations have always been, because you can create only as God creates. Eternity is yours because he created you eternal. Bargaining versus healing. The ego demands reciprocal rights, because it is competitive rather than loving. It is always willing to make a deal but it cannot understand that to be like another means that no deals are possible. To gain you must give, not bargain. To bargain is to limit giving and this is not God's will. To will with God is to create like him. God does not limit his gifts in any way. You are his gifts and so your gifts must be like his. Your gifts to the kingdom must be like his gifts to you. I gave only love to the kingdom because I believed that was what I was. What you believe you are determines your gifts, and if God created you by extending himself as you, you can only extend yourself as he did. Only joy increases forever, since joy and eternity are inseparable. God extends outward beyond limits and beyond time, and you who are co-creators with him, extend his kingdom forever and beyond limit. Eternity is the indelible stamp of creation. The eternal are in peace and joy forever. To think like God is to share his certainty of what you are and to create like him is to share the perfect love he shares with you. To this the Holy Spirit leads you, that your joy may be complete because the kingdom of God is whole. We have said that the last step in the reawakening of knowledge is taken by God. This is true, but it is hard to explain in words, because words are symbols and nothing that is true needs to be explained. However, the Holy Spirit has the task of translating the useless into the useful, the meaning just into the meaningful, and the temporary into the timeless. He can, therefore, tell you something about this last step, although this one you must know yourself, since by it you know what you are. This is your being. God does not take steps because his accomplishments are not gradual. He does not teach because his creations are changeless. He does nothing last because he created first and for always. It must be understood that the word first as applied to him is not a time concept. He is first in the sense that he is the first in the Holy Trinity itself. He is the prime creator because he created his co-creators. Because he did, 
time applies neither to him nor to what he created. The last step that God will take was therefore true in the beginning, is true now, and will be true forever. What is timeless is always there because its being is eternally changeless. It does not change by increase because it was forever created to increase. If you perceive it as not increasing, you do not know what it is. You also do not know what created it, or who he is. God does not reveal this to you because it was never hidden. His light was never obscured because it is his will to share it. How can what is fully shared be withheld, and then revealed? To heal is the only kind of thinking in this world that resembles the thought of God, and because of the elements which they share, can transfer to it. When a brother perceives himself as sick, he is perceiving himself as not whole, and therefore in need. If you, too, see him this way, you are seeing him as if he were absent from the kingdom or separated from it, thus making the kingdom itself obscure to both of you. Sickness and separation are not of God, but the kingdom is. If you obscure the kingdom, you are perceiving what is not of God. The laws of mind. To heal, then, is to correct perception in your brother and yourself by sharing the Holy Spirit with him. This placed you both within the kingdom, and restores its wholeness in your minds. This parallels creation because it unifies by increasing and integrates by extending. What you project you believe. This is an immutable law of the mind in this world as well as in the kingdom. However, the content is different in this world, because the thoughts it governs are very different from the thoughts in the kingdom. Laws must be adapted to circumstances, if they are to maintain order. The outstanding characteristic of the laws of mind as they operate in this world is that by obeying them, and I assure you that you must obey them you can arrive at diametrically opposed results. This is because the laws have adapted to the circumstances of this world, in which diametrically opposed outcomes are believed in. The laws of mind govern thoughts, and you do respond to two conflicting voices. You have heard many arguments on behalf of the freedoms, which would indeed have been freedom if man had not chosen to fight for them. That is why they perceive the freedoms as many, instead of as one. Yet the argument that underlies the defense of freedom is perfectly valid. Because it is true it should not be fought for, but it should be sided with. Those who are against freedom believe that its outcome will hurt them, which cannot be true. But those who are for freedom, even if they are misguided in how to defend it, are siding with the one thing in this world which is true. Whenever anyone can listen fairly to both sides of any issue, he will make the right decision. This is because he is the answer. Conflict can seem to be interpersonal, but it must be intrapersonal first. The term intrapersonal is an ego term, because personal implies of one person, and not of others. Interpersonal has similar error, in that it refers to something that exists among different or separate people. When we spoke before of the extremely personal nature of revelation, we followed this statement immediately with a description of the inevitable outcomes of the revelation in terms of sharing. A person conceives of himself as separate largely because he perceives of himself as bounded by a body. Only if he perceives himself as a mind can this be overcome. Then he is free to use terms like intramental and intermental without seeing them as different or conflicting because minds can be in perfect accord. Outside the kingdom, the law which prevails inside it is adapted to what you project you believe. This is its teaching form, since outside the kingdom teaching is mandatory because learning is essential. This form of the law clearly implies that you will learn what you are from what you have projected onto others and therefore believe they are. In the kingdom there is no teaching or learning because there is no belief. There is only certainty. God and his sons, in the surety of being, know that what you project you are. That form of the law is not adapted at all, being the law of creation. God himself created the law by creating by it. And his sons, who create like him, follow it gladly knowing that the increase of the kingdom depends on it, just as their own creation did. 
laws must be communicated if they are to be helpful. In effect, they must be translated for those who speak a different language. Nevertheless, a good translator, although he must alter the form of what he translates, never changes the meaning. In fact, his whole purpose is to change the form so that the original meaning is retained. The Holy Spirit is the translator of the laws of God to those who do not understand them. You could not do this yourselves because conflicted minds cannot be faithful to one meaning, and will therefore change the meaning to preserve the form. The Holy Spirit's purpose in translating is naturally exactly the opposite. He translates only to preserve the original meaning in all respects and in all languages. Therefore, he opposes differences in form as meaningful, emphasizing always that these differences do not matter. The meaning of his message is always the same, and only the meaning matters. God's law of creation in perfect form does not involve the use of truth to convince his sons of truth. The extension of truth, which is the law of the kingdom, rests only on the knowledge of what truth is. This is your inheritance and requires no learning at all, but when you disinherited yourselves, you became learners. No one questions the intimate connection of learning and memory. Learning is impossible without memory since it cannot be consistent unless it is remembered. That is why the Holy Spirit is a lesson in remembering. We said before that he teaches remembering and forgetting, but the forgetting aspect is only to make the remembering consistent. You forget in order to remember better. You will not understand his translations while you listen to two ways of perceiving them. Therefore, you must forget, or relinquish, one to understand the other. This is the only way you can learn consistency, so that you can finally be consistent. What can the perfect consistency of the kingdom mean to the confused? It is apparent that confusion interferes with meaning, and therefore prevents the learner from appreciating it. There is no confusion in the kingdom, because there is only one meaning. This meaning comes from God and is God. Because it is also you, you share it and extend it as your Creator did. This needs no translation because it is perfectly understood, but it does need extension because it means extension. Communication is perfectly direct and perfectly united. It is totally without strain because nothing discordant ever enters. That is why it is the kingdom of God. It belongs to Him and is therefore like him. That is its reality, and nothing can assail it. The Unified Curriculum. To heal is to liberate totally. We once said there is no order of difficulty in miracles because they are all maximal expressions of love. This has no range at all. The non-maximal only appears to have a range. This is because it seems to be meaningful to measure it from the maximum and identify its position by how much it is not there. Actually, this does not mean anything. It is like negative numbers in that the concept can be used theoretically, but it has no application practically. It is true that if you put three apples on the table and then take them away, the three apples are not there. But it is not true that the table is now minus three apples. If there is nothing on the table, it does not matter what was there in terms of amount. The nothing is neither greater nor less because of what is absent. That is why all and nothing are dichotomous, without a range. This is perfectly clear in considering psychological tests of maximal performance. You cannot interpret the results at all unless you assume either maximal motivation or no motivation at all. Only in these two conditions can you validly compare responses, and you must assume the former because, if the latter were true, the subject would not do anything. Given variable motivation he will do something, but you cannot understand what it is. The results of such tests are evaluated relatively assuming maximal motivation, but this is because we are dealing with abilities, where degree of development is meaningful. This does not mean that what the ability is used for is necessarily either limited or divided. Yet one thing is certain, abilities are potentials for learning, and you will apply them to what you want to learn. Learning is effort, and effort means will.
We have used the term abilities in the plural because abilities began with the ego, which perceived them as potentials for excelling. This is how the ego still perceives them and uses them. The ego does not want to teach everyone all it has learned, because that would defeat its purpose. Therefore, it does not really learn at all. The Holy Spirit teaches you to use what the ego has made to teach the opposite of what the ego has learned. The kind of learning is as irrelevant as is the particular ability which was applied to the learning. You could not have a better example of the Holy Spirit's unified purpose than this course. The Holy Spirit has taken very diversified areas of your learning, and has applied them to a unified curriculum. The fact that this was not the ego's reason for learning is totally irrelevant. You made the effort to learn, and the Holy Spirit has a unified goal for all effort. He adapts the ego's potentials for excelling to potentials for equalizing. This makes them useless for the ego's purpose, but very useful for his. If different abilities are applied long enough to one goal, the abilities themselves become unified. This is because they are channelized in one direction, or in one way. Ultimately, then, they all contribute to one result, and by so doing, their similarity rather than their differences is emphasized. You can excel in many different ways but you can equalize in one way only. Equality is not a variable state, by definition. That is why you will be able to perform all aspects of your work with ease when you have learned this course. To the ego there appears to be no connection because the ego is discontinuous. Yet the Holy Spirit teaches one lesson, and applies it to all individuals in all situations. Being conflict-free. He maximizes all efforts and all results. By teaching the power of the kingdom of God himself, he teaches you that all power is yours. Its application does not matter. It is always maximal. Your vigilance does not establish it as yours, but it does enable you to use it always and in all ways. When I said, I am with you always, I meant it literally. I am not absent to anyone, in any situation. Because I am always with you, you are the way and the truth and the light. You did not make this power any more than I did. It was created to be shared, and therefore cannot be meaningfully perceived as belonging to anyone at the expense of another. Such a perception makes it meaningless by eliminating or overlooking its real and only meaning. The Recognition of Truth God's meaning waits in the kingdom because that is where he placed it. It does not wait in time. It merely rests in the kingdom because it belongs there, as you do. How can you, who are God's meaning, perceive yourselves as absent from it? You can see yourselves as separated from your meaning only by experiencing yourself as unreal. This is why the ego is insane, it teaches that you are not what you are. This is so contradictory that it is clearly impossible. It is therefore a lesson which you cannot really learn, and therefore, cannot really teach. Yet you are always teaching. You must, therefore, be teaching something else as well, even though the ego does not know what it is. The ego, then is always being undone, and does suspect your motives. Your mind cannot be unified in allegiance to the ego, because the mind does not belong to it. Yet what is treacherous to the ego is faithful to peace. The ego's enemy is therefore your friend. We said before that the ego's friend is not part of you, since the ego perceives itself as at war, and therefore in need of allies. You, who are not at war, must look for brothers and recognize all whom you see as brothers, because only equals are at peace. Because God's equal sons have everything, they cannot compete. Yet if they perceive any of their brothers as anything other than their perfect equals, the idea of competition has entered their minds. Do not underestimate your need to be vigilant against this idea, because all your conflicts come from it. It is the belief that conflicting interests are possible, and therefore you have accepted the impossible as true. How is that different from saying that you are perceiving yourself as unreal? To be in the kingdom is merely to focus your full attention on it. As long as you believe that you can attend to what is not true, 
you are accepting conflict as your choice. Is it really a choice? It seems to be, but seeming and reality are hardly the same. You who are the kingdom are not concerned with seeming. Reality is yours because you are reality. This is how having and being are ultimately reconciled, not in the kingdom, but in your minds. The altar there is the only reality. The altar is perfectly clear in thought because it is a reflection of perfect thought. It sees only brothers because it sees only in its own light. God has lit your minds himself, and keeps your minds lit by his light because his light is what your minds are. This is totally beyond question, and when you questioned it, you were answered. The answer merely undoes the question by establishing the fact that to question reality is to question meaninglessly. That is why the Holy Spirit never questions. His sole function is to undo the questionable, and thus lead to certainty. The certain are perfectly calm because they are not in doubt. They do not raise questions because nothing questionable enters their minds. This holds them in perfect serenity because this is what they share, knowing what they are. As has so often been said, healing is both an art and a science. It is an art because it depends on inspiration in the sense that we have already used the term. Inspiration is the opposite of dispiriting, and therefore means to make joyous. The dispirited are depressed because they believe that they are literally without the spirit, which is an illusion. You do not put the spirit in them by inspiring them because that would be magic, and therefore would not be real healing. You do, however, recognize the spirit that is already there and thereby reawaken it. This is why the healer is part of the resurrection and the life. The spirit is not asleep in the minds of the sick, but the part of the mind that can perceive it and be glad is. Healing is also a science because it obeys the laws of God, whose laws are true. Because they are true they are perfectly dependable, and therefore universal in application. The real aim of science is neither prediction nor control, but only understanding. This is because it does not establish the laws it seeks, cannot discover them through prediction, and has no control over them at all. Science is nothing more than an approach to what already is. Like inspiration it can be misunderstood as magic, and will be whenever it is undertaken as separate from what already is, and perceived as a means for establishing it. To believe this is possible is to believe you can do it. This can only be the voice of the ego. Truth can only be recognized, and need only be recognized. Inspiration is of the Spirit, and certainty is of God according to His laws. Both, therefore, come from the same source, since inspiration comes from the voice for God and certainty comes from the laws of God. Healing does not come directly from God, who knows His creations as perfectly whole. Yet healing is still of God because it proceeds from his voice and from his laws. It is their result, in a state of mind which does not know him. The state is unknown to him and therefore does not exist, but those who sleep are stupefied, or better, unaware. Because they are unaware, they do not know. The Holy Spirit must work through you to teach you he is in you. This is an intermediary step toward the knowledge that you are in God because you are part of him. The miracles which the Holy Spirit inspires can have no order of difficulty because every part of creation is of one order. This is God's will and yours. The laws of God establish this, and the Holy Spirit reminds you of it. When you heal, you are remembering the laws of God and forgetting the laws of the ego. We said before that forgetting is merely a way of remembering better. It is therefore not the opposite of remembering, when it is properly perceived. Perceived improperly, it induces a perception of conflict with something else, as all incorrect perception does. Properly perceived, it can be used as a way out of conflict, as all proper perception can. All abilities, then should be given over to the Holy Spirit who knows how to use them properly. He can use them only for healing because he knows you only is whole. By healing you learn of wholeness, and by learning of wholeness you learn to remember God. You have forgotten him, but the Holy Spirit still knows that your forgetting must be translated into a way of remembering, 
and not perceived as a separate ability which opposes an opposite. That is the way in which the ego tries to use all abilities, since its goal is always to make you believe that you are in opposition. The ego's goal is as unified as the Holy Spirit's, and it is because of this that their goals can never be reconciled in any way or to any extent. The ego always seeks to divide and separate. The Holy Spirit always seeks to unify and heal. As you heal you are healed because the Holy Spirit sees no order of healing. Healing is the way to undo the belief in differences, being the only way of perceiving the sonship without this belief. This perception is therefore in accord with the laws of God even in a state of mind which is out of accord with His. The strength of right perception is so great that it brings the mind into accord with His because it yields to His pull, which is in all of you. To oppose the pull or the will of God is not an ability but a real delusion. The ego believes that it has this ability, and can offer it to you as a gift. You do not want it. It is not a gift. It is nothing at all. God has given you a gift which you both have and are. When you do not use it, you do not know you have it. By not knowing this, you do not know what you are. Healing, then, is a way of approaching knowledge by thinking in accordance with the laws of God, and recognizing their universality. Without this recognition, you have made the laws themselves meaningless to you. Yet the laws are not meaningless since all meaning is contained by them and in them. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven because that is where the laws of God operate truly, and they can operate only truly, since they are the laws of truth. But seek this only because you can find nothing else. There is nothing else. God is all in all in a very literal sense. All being is in him who is all being. You are therefore in him since your being is his. Healing is a way of forgetting the sense of danger the ego has induced in you by not recognizing its existence in your brothers. This strengthens the Holy Spirit in both of you because it is a refusal to acknowledge fear. Love needs only this invitation. It comes freely to all the sonship, being what the sonship is. By your awakening to it, you are merely forgetting what you are not. This enables you to remember what you are. Healing and the changelessness of mind. The body is nothing more than framework abilities. Is a for developing potentials, which is quite apart what potential is used for. Is a decision. The effects of the ego's decision in this matter are so apparent that they need no elaboration here. But Holy Spirit's decision to use the body only for communication has such a direct connection with healing that it does need clarification. The unhealed healer obviously does not understand his own vocation. Only minds communicate. Since the ego cannot obliterate the impulse to communicate because it is also the impulse to create, the ego can only teach you that the body can both communicate and create, and therefore does not need the mind. The ego thus tries to teach you that the body can act like the mind, and is therefore self-sufficient. Yet we have learned that behavior is not the level for either teaching or learning. This must be so, since you can act in accordance with what you do not believe. To do this, however, will weaken you as teachers and learners because, as has been repeatedly emphasized you teach what you do believe. An inconsistent lesson will be poorly taught and poorly learned. If you teach both sickness and healing you are both a poor teacher and a poor learner. Healing is the one ability which everyone can develop and must develop, if he is to healed. Is the Holy Spirit's form of communication, and the only one he knows. He recognizes no other because he does not accept the ego's confusion of mind and body. Minds can communicate, but they cannot hurt. The body in the service of the ego can hurt other bodies, but this cannot occur unless the body has already been confused with the mind. This fact, too, can be used either for healing or for magic, but you must remember that magic is always the belief that healing is harmful. This is its totally insane premise, and so it proceeds accordingly. Healing only strengthens. Magic always tries to weaken. Healing perceives nothing in the healer that everyone else does not share with him. Magic always sees something special in the healer, 
which he believes he can offer as a gift to someone who does not have it. He may believe that the gift comes from God to him, but it is quite evident that he does not understand God if he thinks he has something that others lack. You might well ask, then, why some healing can result from this kind of thinking, and there is a reason for this. However misguided the magical healer be, he is also trying to help. He is conflicted and unstable, but at times he is offering something to the sonship, and only the sonship can accept his healing. When the so-called healing works, then, to help and to be helped have coincided. This is coincidental, because the healer may not be experiencing himself as truly helpful at the time, but the belief that he is, in the mind of another, helps him. The Holy Spirit does not work by chance, and healing that is of him always works. Unless the healer always heals by him, the results will vary. Yet healing itself is consistence since only consistence is conflict-free, and only the conflict-free are whole. By accepting exceptions and acknowledging that he can sometimes heal and sometimes not, the healer is obviously accepting inconsistency. He is therefore in conflict and teaching conflict. Can anything of God not be for all and for always? Love is incapable of any exceptions. Only if there is fear does the idea of exceptions seem to be meaningful. Exceptions are fearful because they are made by fear. The fearful healer is a contradiction in terms, and is therefore a concept which only a conflicted mind could possibly perceive as meaningful. Fear does not gladden. Healing does. Fear always makes exceptions. Healing never does. Fear produces dissociation because it induces separation. Healing always produces harmony because it proceeds from integration. Healing is predictable because it can be counted on. Everything that is of God can be counted on, because everything of God is wholly real. Healing can be counted on because it is inspired by His voice, and is in accord with His laws. Yet if healing is consistent, it cannot be inconsistently understood. Understanding means consistence God means consistence. Since that is his meaning, it is also yours. Your meaning cannot be out of accord with his because your whole meaning, and your only meaning, comes from his and is like his. God cannot be out of accord with himself, and you cannot be out of accord with him. You cannot separate yourself from your creator, who created you by sharing his being with you. The unhealed healer wants gratitude from his brothers, but he not grateful to them. This is because he thinks he is giving something to them and is not receiving something equally desirable in return. His teaching is limited because he is learning so little. His healing lesson is limited by his own ingratitude, which is a lesson in sickness. Learning constant, so vital in its power for change that a son of God can recognize his power in one instant, and change the world in the next. That is because, by changing his mind, he has changed the most powerful device that was ever created for change. This in no way contradicts the changelessness of God created it, but you think that you have changed it as long as you learn through the ego. This does place you in a position of needing to learn a lesson which seems contradictory, you must learn to change your mind about your mind. Only by this can you learn that it is changeless. When you heal, that is exactly what you are learning. You are recognizing the changeless mind in your brother by realizing that he could not have changed his mind. That is how you perceive the Holy Spirit in him. It is only the Holy Spirit in him that never changes his mind. He himself must think he can, or he would not perceive himself as sick. He therefore does not know what his self is. If you see only the changeless in him, you have not really changed him at all. By changing your mind about his for him, you help him undo the change his ego thinks it has made in him. As you can hear to voices, so you can see into ways. One way shows you an image, or better, an idol, which you may worship out of fear, but which you will never love. The other shows you only truth, which you will love because you will understand it. Understanding is appreciation. What you understand you can identify with, and by making it part of you, you have accepted it with love. 
that is how God himself created you, in understanding, appreciation, and in love. The is totally unable to understand this because it does not understand what it makes, it does not appreciate it, it not love it. It incorporates to take away. It literally believes that time it deprives someone of something, it has increased. We have spoken often of the increase of the kingdom by your creations, which can only be created as you were. The whole glory and perfect joy that is the kingdom lies in you to give. Do you not want to give it? From vigilance to peace. Although you can love the sonship only as one, you can perceive it as fragmented. It is impossible, however, for you to see something in part of it that you will not attribute to all of it. That is why attack is never discreet, and why attack must be relinquished entirely. If it is not relinquished entirely, it is not relinquished at all. Fear and love are equally reciprocal. They make or create depending on whether the ego or the Holy Spirit begets or inspires them, but they will return to the mind of the thinker, and they will affect his total perception. That includes his perception of God, of his creations, and of his own. He will not appreciate any of them if he regards them fearfully. He will appreciate all of them if he regards them with love. The mind that accepts attack cannot love. That is because it believes that it can destroy love, and therefore does not understand what love is. If it does not understand what love is, it cannot perceive itself as loving. This loses the awareness of being, induces feelings of unreality, and results in utter confusion. Your own thinking has done this because of its power, but your own thinking can also save you from this because its power is not of your making. Your ability to direct your thinking as you will is part of its power. If you do not believe you can do this, you have denied the power of your thought, and thus rendered it powerless in your belief. The ingeniousness of the ego to preserve itself is enormous, but it stems from the power of the mind which the ego denies. This means that the ego attacks what is preserving it, and this must be a source of extreme anxiety. That is why the ego never knows what it is doing. It is perfectly logical, but clearly insane. The ego draws upon the one source which is totally inimical to its existence for its existence. Fearful of perceiving the power of this source, it is forced to depreciate it. This threatens its own existence, a state which it finds intolerable. Remaining logical but still insane. The ego resolves this completely insane dilemma in a completely insane way. It does not perceive its existence as threatened by projecting the threat onto you, and perceiving your being as non-existent. This ensures its continuance, if you side with it, by guaranteeing that you will not know your own safety. The ego cannot afford to know anything. Knowledge is total and the ego does not believe in totality. This unbelief is its origin, and while the ego does not love you, it is faithful to its own antecedents, begetting as it was begotten. Mind always reproduces as it was produced. Produced by fear, the ego reproduces fear. This is its allegiance, and this allegiance makes it treacherous to love because you are love. Love is your power, which the ego must deny. It must also deny everything which this power gives you because it gives you everything. No one who has everything wants the ego. Its own maker, then, does not want it. Rejection is therefore the only decision which the ego could possibly encounter, if the mind which made it knew itself. And if it recognized any part of the sonship it would know itself. The ego therefore opposes all appreciation, all recognition all sane perception and all knowledge. It perceives their threat as total because it senses the fact that all commitments the mind makes are total. Forced, therefore, to detach itself from you who are mind, it is willing to attach itself to anything else. But there is nothing else. It does not follow that the mind cannot make illusions, but it does follow that, if it makes illusions, it will believe in them, because that is how it made them. The Holy Spirit undoes illusions without attacking them merely because he cannot perceive them at all. They therefore do not exist for him. He resolves the apparent conflict which they engender by perceiving conflict as meaningless. 
We said before that the Holy Spirit perceives the conflict exactly as it is and it is meaningless. The Holy Spirit does not want you to understand conflict, he wants you to realize that because conflict is meaningless, it cannot be understood. We have already said that understanding brings appreciation, and appreciation brings love. Nothing else can be understood because nothing else is real and therefore nothing else is meaning. If you will keep in mind what the Holy Spirit offers you, you cannot be vigilant for anything but God and His kingdom. The only reason you find this difficult is because you think there is something else. Belief does not require vigilance unless it is conflicted. If it is, there are conflicting components within it which have engendered a state of war and vigilance therefore has become essential. Vigilance has no place at all in peace. It is necessary against beliefs which are not true and would never have been called upon by the Holy Spirit if you had not believed the untrue. You cannot deny that when you believe something, you have made it true for you. When you believe what God does not know, your thought seems to contradict his, and this make it appear as if you are attacking him. We have repeatedly emphasized that the ego does believe it can attack God and tries to persuade you that you have done this. If the mind cannot attack, the ego proceeds perfectly logically to the position that you cannot be mind. By not seeing you as you are, it can see itself as it wants to be. Aware of its weakness the ego wants your allegiance, but not as you really are. The ego therefore wants to engage your mind in its own delusional system because otherwise the light of your understanding would dispel it. The ego wants no part of truth because the truth is that the ego is not true. If truth is total the untrue cannot exist. Commitment to either must be total, since they cannot coexist in your minds without splitting them. If they cannot coexist in peace and if you want peace, you must give up the idea of conflict entirely and for all time. While you believe that two totally contradictory thought systems share truth, your need for vigilance is apparent. Your minds are dividing their allegiance between two kingdoms and you are totally committed to neither. Your identification with the kingdom is totally beyond question except by you, when you are thinking insanely. What you are is not established by your perception and is not influenced by it at all. All perceived problems in identification at any level are not problems of fact. They are problems of understanding, since they mean that you believe what you can understand is up to you to decide. The ego believes this totally, being fully committed to it. It is not true. The ego therefore is totally committed to untruth perceiving in total contradiction to the Holy Spirit and to the knowledge of God. You can be perceived with meaning only by the Holy Spirit because your being is the knowledge of God. Any belief that you accept which is apart from this will obscure God's voice in you and will therefore obscure God to you. Unless you perceive his creation truly you cannot know the Creator, since God and his creation are not separate. The oneness of the Creator and the creation is your wholeness, your sanity and your limitless power. This limitless power is God's gift to you because it is what you are. If you dissociate your mind from it, you are perceiving the most powerful force in the universe as if it were weak because you do not believe you are part of it. Perceived without your part in it God's creation is perceived as weak and those who see themselves as weak and do attack. The attack must be blind, however, because there is nothing to attack. Therefore, they make up images, perceive them as unworthy and attack them for their unworthiness. That is all the world of the ego is. Nothing. It has no meaning. It does not exist. Do not try to understand it because, if you do, you are believing that it can be understood and is therefore capable of being appreciated and loved. That would justify it, and it cannot be justified. You cannot make the meaningless meaningful. This can only be an insane attempt. Allowing insanity to enter your minds means that you have not judged sanity as wholly desirable. If you want something else you will make something else, but because it is something else it will attack your thought system and divide your allegiance. You cannot create in this divided state and you must be vigilant against this divided state because only peace can be extended. Your divided minds are blocking the extension of the kingdom, 
and its extension is your joy. If you do not extend the kingdom, you are not thinking with your creator and creating as he created. In this depressing state the Holy Spirit reminds you gently that you are sad because you are not fulfilling your function as co-creators with God and are therefore depriving yourselves of joy. This is not God's will, but yours. If your will is out of accord with God's, you are willing without meaning. Yet because God's will is unchangeable, no real conflict of will is possible. This is the Holy Spirit's perfectly consistent teaching. Creation, not separation, is your will because it is God's and nothing that opposes this means anything at all. Being a perfect accomplishment, the Sonship can only accomplish perfectly, extending the joy in which it was created and identifying itself with both its Creator and its creations, knowing they are one. The Total Commitment Whenever you deny a blessing to a brother you will feel deprived. This is because denial is as total as love. It is as impossible to deny part of the sonship as it is to love it in part. Nor is it possible to love it totally at times. You cannot be totally committed sometimes. Remember a very early lesson, never underestimate the power of denial. It has no power in itself, but you can give it the power of your mind whose power is without limit of any kind. If you use it to deny reality, reality is gone for you. Reality cannot be partly appreciated. That is why denying any part of it means you have lost awareness of all of it. That is the negative side of the law, as it operates in this world. Yet denial is a defense, and so it is as capable of being used positively as it is of being used destructively. Used negatively, it will be destructive because it will be used for attack, but in the service of the Holy Spirit, the law requires you to recognize only part of reality to appreciate all of it. Mind is too powerful to be subject to exclusion. You will never be able to exclude yourself from what you project. When a brother acts insanely, he is offering you an opportunity to bless him. His need is yours. You need the blessing you can offer him. There is no way for you to have it except by giving it. This is the law of God, and it has no exceptions. What you deny you lack, not because it is lacking, but because you have denied it in another, and are therefore not aware of it in you. Every response you make is determined by what you think you are, and what you want to be is what you think you are. Therefore, what you want to be determines every response you make. You do not need God's blessing since that you have forever, but you do need yours. The picture you see of yourselves is deprived, unloving and very vulnerable. You cannot love this. Yet you can very easily escape from it, or better, leave it behind. You are not there, and that is not you. Do not see this picture in anyone, or you have accepted it as you. All illusions about the sonship are dispelled together, as they were made together teach no one that he is what you would not want to be. Your brother is the mirror in which you will see the image of yourself, as long as perception lasts. And perception will last until the sonship knows itself as whole. You made perception, and it must last as long as you want it. Illusions are investments. They will last as long as you value them. Values are relative, but they are powerful because they are mental judgments. The only way to dispel illusions is to withdraw all investment from them, and they will have no life for you because you have put them out of your mind. While you include them in it, you are giving life to them. Except there is nothing there to receive your gift. The gift of life is yours to give, because it was given you. You are unaware of your gift because you do not give it. You cannot make nothing live, since it cannot be enlivened. Therefore, you are not extending the gift you both have and are, and so you do not know your being. All confusion comes from not extending life, since that is not the will of your Creator. You can do nothing apart from Him, and you do do nothing apart from Him. Keep His way to remember yourselves, and teach His way, lest you forget yourselves. Give only honor to the sons of the living God, and count yourselves among them gladly. Only honor is a fitting gift for those whom God himself created worthy of honor, and whom he honors.
give them the appreciation which God accords them always, because they are his beloved sons in whom he is well pleased. You cannot be apart from them because you are not apart from him. Rest in his love, and protect your rest by loving. But love everything he created, of which you are a part, or you cannot learn of his peace, and accept his gift for yourself and as yourself. You cannot know your own perfection until you have honored all those who are created like you. One child of God is the only teacher sufficiently worthy to teach another. One teacher is in all your minds, and he teaches the same lesson to all. He always teaches you the inestimable worth of every son of God, teaching it with infinite patience born of the infinite love for which he speaks. Every attack is a call for his patience since only his patience can translate attack into blessing. Those who attack do not know they are blessed. They attack because they believe they are deprived. Give, therefore, of your abundance and teach your brothers theirs. Do not share their delusions of scarcity, or you will perceive yourself as lacking. Attack could never promote attack unless you perceived it as a means of depriving you of something you want. Yet you cannot lose anything unless you did not value it, and therefore did not want it. This makes you feel deprived of it, and by projecting your own rejection, you believe that others are taking it from you. One must be fearful, if he believes that his brother is attacking him to tear the kingdom of heaven from him. This is the ultimate basis for all of the ego's projection. Being the part of your mind which does not believe it is responsible for itself and being without allegiance to God, the ego is incapable of trust. Projecting its insane belief that you have been treacherous to your Creator, it believes that your brothers, who are as incapable of this as you are, are out to take God from you. Whenever a brother attacks another, this is what he believes. Projection always sees your will in others. If you will to separate yourself from God, that is what you will think others are doing to you you are the will of God. Do not accept anything else as your will, or you are denying what you are. Deny this and you will attack, believing you have been attacked. But see the love of God in you, and you will see it everywhere because it is everywhere. See his abundance in everyone, and you will know that you are in him with them. They are part of you, as you are part of God. You are as lonely without understanding this as God himself is lonely when his sons do not know him. The peace of God is understanding this. There is only one way out of the world's thinking, just as there was only one way into it. Understand totally but understanding totality. Perceive any part of the ego's thought system as wholly insane, wholly delusional and wholly undesirable and you have correctly evaluated all of it. This correction enables you to perceive any part of creation as wholly real, wholly perfect, and wholly desirable. Wanting this only, you will have this only and giving this only, you will be only this. The gifts you offer to the ego are always experienced as sacrifices, but the gifts you offer to the kingdom are gifts to you. They will always be treasured by God because they belong to his beloved sons, who belong to him. All power and glory are yours because the kingdom is his. The Defense of Conflict We once said that without projection there can be no anger, but it is also true that without projection there can be no love. Projection is a fundamental law of the mind, and therefore one which always operates. It is the law by which you create and were created. It is the law which unifies the kingdom, and keeps it in the mind of God to the ego. The law is perceived as a way of getting rid of something it does not want. To the Holy Spirit, it is the fundamental law of sharing by which you give what you value in order to keep it in your own mind. Projection, to the Holy Spirit, is the law of extension. To the ego, it is the law of deprivation. It therefore produces abundance or scarcity, depending on how you choose to apply it. This choice is up to you. But it is not up to you to decide whether or not you will utilize projection. Every mind must project because that is how it lives, and every mind is life.
The ego's use of projection must be fully understood before its inevitable association between projection and anger can be finally undone. The ego always tries to preserve conflict. It is very ingenious in devising ways which seem to diminish conflict because it does not want you to find conflict so intolerable that you will insist on giving it up. Therefore, the ego tries to persuade you that it can free you of conflict, lest you give the ego up and free yourself. The ego, using its own warped version of the laws of God, utilizes the power of the mind only to defeat the mind's real purpose. It projects conflict from your mind to other minds, in an attempt to persuade you that you have gotten rid of it. This has several fallacies, which may not be so apparent. Strictly speaking, conflict cannot be projected precisely because it cannot be fully shared. Any attempt to keep part of it and get rid of another part does not really mean anything. Remember that a conflicted teacher is a poor teacher and a poor learner. His lessons are confused and their transfer value is severely limited by his confusion. A second fallacy is the idea that you can get rid of something you do not want by giving it away. Giving it is how you keep it. The belief that by giving it out you have excluded it from within is a complete distortion of the power of extension. That is why those who project from the ego are vigilant for their own safety. They are afraid that their projections will return and hurt them. They do believe they have blotted their projections from their own minds, but they also believe their projections are trying to creep back into them. That is because the projections have not left their minds, and this, in turn, forces them to engage in compulsive activity in order not to recognize this. You cannot perpetuate an illusion about another without perpetuating it about yourself. There is no way out of this because it is impossible to fragment the mind. To fragment is to break into pieces, and mind cannot attack or be attacked. The belief that it can, a fallacy which the ego always makes, underlies its whole use of projection. It does not understand what mind is, and therefore does not understand what you are. Yet its existence is dependent on your mind because the ego is your belief. The ego is therefore a confusion in identification which never had a consistent model and never developed consistently. It is the distorted product of the misapplication of the laws of God, by distorted minds which are misusing their own power. Do not be afraid of the ego. It does depend on your mind, and as you made it by believing in it, so you can dispel it by withdrawing belief from it. Do not project the responsibility for your belief in it onto anyone else, or you will preserve the belief. When you are willing to accept sole responsibility for the ego's existence yourself you will have laid aside all anger and all attack, because they come from an attempt to project responsibility for your own errors. But having accepted the errors as yours, do not keep them. Give them over quickly to the Holy Spirit to be undone completely, so that all their effects will vanish from your minds, and from the sonship as a whole. The Holy Spirit will teach you to perceive beyond belief because truth is beyond belief and his perception is true. The ego can be completely forgotten at any time because it was always a belief that is totally incredible. No one can keep a belief he has judged to be unbelievable. The more you learn about the ego, the more you realize that it cannot be believed. The incredible cannot be understood because it is unbelievable. The utter meaninglessness of all perception that comes from the unbelievable must be apparent, but it is not recognized as beyond belief because it was made by belief. The whole purpose of this course is to teach you that the ego is unbelievable and will forever be unbelievable. You who made the ego by believing the unbelievable cannot make this judgment alone. By accepting the atonement for yourself, you are deciding against the belief that you can be alone thus dispelling the idea of separation and affirming your true identification with the whole kingdom as literally part of you. This identification is as beyond doubt as it is beyond belief. Your wholeness has no limits because being is in infinity. The extension of the kingdom. Only you can limit your creative power, but God wills to release it. 
He no more wills you to deprive yourself of your creations than he wills to deprive himself of his. Do not withhold your gifts to the sonship, or you withhold yourself from God. Selfishness is of the ego but selffulness is of the soul because that is how God created it. The Holy Spirit is the part of the mind that lies between the ego and the soul, mediating between them always in favor of the soul. To the ego this is partiality and it therefore responds as if it were the part that is being sided against. To the soul this is truth, because it know its fullness, and cannot conceive of any part from which it is excluded. The soul knows that the consciousness of all its brothers is included in its own, as it is included in God. The power of the whole sonship and of its creator is therefore the soul's own fullness rendering its creations equally whole and equal in perfection. The ego cannot prevail against a totality which includes God and any totality must include God. Everything he created is given all his power because it is part of him and shares his being with him. Creating is the opposite of loss, as blessing is the opposite of sacrifice. Being must be extended. That is how it retains the knowledge of itself. The soul yearns to share its being as its creator did. Created by sharing, its will is to create. It does not wish to contain God but to extend his being. The extension of God's being is the soul's only function. Its fullness cannot be contained, any more than can the fullness of its creator. Fullness is extension. The ego's whole thought system blocks extension and thus blocks your only function. It therefore blocks your joy, and that is why you perceive yourselves as unfulfilled. Unless you create you are unfulfilled, but God does not know of unfulfillment, and therefore you must create. You may not know your own creations, but this can no more interfere with their reality than your unawareness of your soul can interfere with its being. The kingdom is forever extending because it is in the mind of God. You do not know your joy because you do not know your own soulness. Exclude any part of the kingdom from yourself, and you are not whole. A split mind cannot perceive its fullness and needs the miracle of its wholeness to dawn upon it and heal it. This reawakens the wholeness in it, and restores it to the kingdom because of its acceptance of wholeness. The full appreciation of its self-fullness makes selfishness impossible and extension inevitable. That is why there is perfect peace in the kingdom. Every soul is fulfilling its function and only complete fulfillment is peace. Insanity appears to add reality, but no one would claim that what it adds is true. Insanity is therefore the non-extension of truth, which blocks joy because it blocks creation and thus blocks self-fulfillment. The unfulfilled must be depressed because their self-fullness is unknown to them. Your creations are protected for you because the Holy Spirit who is in your mind knows of them and can bring them into your awareness whenever you will let him. They are there as part of your own being because your fulfillment includes them. The creations of every son of God are yours since every creation belongs to everyone, being created for the sonship as a whole. You have not failed to add to the inheritance of the sons of God and thus have not failed to secure it for yourselves. If it was the will of God to give it to you, he gave it forever. If it was his will that you have it forever, he gave you the means for keeping it and you have done so. Disobeying God's will is meaningful only to the insane. In truth it is impossible. Your self-fullness is as boundless as God's. Like his, it extends forever and in perfect peace. Its radiance is so intense that it creates in perfect joy and only the whole can be born of its wholeness. Be confident that you have never lost your identity and the extensions which maintain it in wholeness and peace. Miracles are an expression of this confidence. They are reflections both of your own proper identification with your brothers and of your own awareness that your identification is maintained by extension. The miracle is a lesson in total perception. By including any part of totality in the lesson, you have included the whole. You have said that when you write of the kingdom and your creations which belong in it, you are describing what you do not know. That is true in a sense, but no more true than your failure to acknowledge the whole result of the ego's premises.
The kingdom is the result of premises, just as this world is. You have carried the ego's reasoning to its logical conclusion, which is total confusion about everything. Yet you do not really believe this, or you could not possible maintain it. If you really saw this result, you could not want it. The only reason why you could possibly want any part of it is because you do not see the whole of it. You are willing to look at the ego's premises, but not at their logical outcome. Is it not possible that you have done the same thing with the premises of God? Your creations are the logical outcome of his premises. His thinking has established them for you. They are therefore there, exactly where they belong. They belong in your mind as part of your identification with his, but your state of mind and your recognition of what is in your mind depends, at any given moment, on what you believe about your mind. Whatever these beliefs may be, they are the premises which will determine what you accept into your mind. It is surely clear that you can both accept into your mind what is not really there, and deny what is. Neither of these possibilities requires further elaboration here, but both are clearly indefensible, even if you elect to defend them. Yet the function which God himself gave your minds through his you may deny, but you cannot prevent. It is the logical outcome of what you are. The ability to see a logical outcome depends on the willingness to see it, but its truth has nothing to do with your willingness at all. Truth is God's will. Share his will and you share what he knows. Deny his will as yours and you are denying his kingdom and yours. The Holy Spirit will direct you only so as to avoid pain. The undoing of pain must obviously avoid pain. Surely no one would object to this goal if he recognized it. The problem is not whether what the Holy Spirit says is true but whether you want to listen to what he says. The Confusion of Strength and Weakness you no more recognize what is painful than you know what is joyful and are, in fact, very apt to confuse the two. The Holy Spirit's main function is to teach you to tell them apart. However strange it may seem that this is necessary, it obviously is. The reason is equally obvious. What is joyful to you is painful to the ego, and as long as you are in doubt about what you are, you will be confused about joy and pain. This confusion is the cause of the whole idea of sacrifice. Obey the Holy Spirit and you will be giving up the ego. But you will be sacrificing nothing. On the contrary, you will be gaining everything. If you believed this there would be no conflict. That is why you need to demonstrate the obvious to yourselves. It is not obvious to you. You believe that doing the opposite of God's will can be better for you. You also believe that it is possible to do the opposite of God's will. Therefore, you believe that an impossible choice is open to you and one which is both very fearful and very desirable. Yet God wills. He does not wish. Your will is as powerful as his because it is his. The ego's wishes do not mean anything, because the ego wishes for the impossible. You can wish for the impossible, but you can will only with God. This is the ego's weakness and your strength. The Holy Spirit always sides with you and with your strength. As long as you avoid his guidance in any way, you want to be weak. Yet weakness is frightening. What else, then, can this decision mean except that you want to be fearful? The Holy Spirit never asks for sacrifice, but the ego always does. When you are confused about this very clear distinction in motivation, it can only be due to projection. Projection of this kind is a confusion in motivation, and given this confusion, trust becomes impossible. No one obeys gladly a guide he does not trust, but this does not mean that the guide is untrustworthy. In this case, it always means that the follower is. However, this, too, is merely a matter of his own belief believing that he can betray. He believes that everything can betray him. Yet this is only because he has elected to follow false guidance. Unable to follow this guidance without fear, he associates fear with guidance and refuses to follow any guidance at all. The Holy Spirit is perfectly trustworthy, as you are. 
God himself trusts you and therefore your trustworthiness is beyond question. It will always remain beyond question, however much you may question it. We said before that you are the will of God. His will is not an idle wish and your identification with his will is not optional since it is what you are. Sharing his will with me is not really open to choice, though it may seem to be. The whole separation lies in this fallacy. The only way out of the fallacy is to decide that you do not have to decide anything. Everything has been given you by God's decision. That is his will and you cannot undo it. Even the relinquishment of your false decision-making prerogative which the ego guards so jealously, is not accomplished by your wish. It was accomplished for you by the will of God, who has not left you comfortless. His voice will teach you how to distinguish between pain and joy and will lead you out of the confusion which you have made. There is no confusion in the mind of a son of God, whose will must be the will of the Father because the Father's will is his Son. Miracles are in accord with the will of God, whose will you do not know, because you are confused about what you will. This means that you are confused about what you are. If you are God's will and do not accept his will, you are denying joy. The miracle is therefore a lesson in what joy is. Being a lesson in sharing, it is a lesson in love, which is joy. Every miracle is thus a lesson in truth and by offering truth you are learning the difference between pain and joy. The State of Grace The Holy Spirit will always guide you truly, because your joy is His. This is His will for everyone, because He speaks for the Kingdom of God, which is joy. Following Him is therefore the easiest thing in the world and the only thing that is easy because it is not of the world, and is therefore natural. The world goes against your nature, being out of accord with God's laws. The world perceives orders of difficulty in everything. This is because the ego perceives nothing as wholly desirable. By demonstrating to yourselves that there is no order of difficulty in miracles, you will convince yourselves that, in your natural state, there is no difficulty because it is a state of grace. Grace is the natural state of every son of God. When he is not in a state of grace, he is out of his natural environment and does not function well. Everything he does becomes a strain, because he was not created for the environment that he has made. He therefore cannot adapt to it, nor can he adapt it to him. There is no point in trying. A son of God is happy only when he knows he is with God. That is the only environment in which he will not experience strain because that is where he belongs. It is also the only environment that is worthy of him, because his own worth is beyond anything he can make. Consider the kingdom you have made and judge its worth fairly. Is it worthy to be a home for a child of God? Does it protect his peace and shine love upon him? Does it keep his heart untouched by fear and allow him to give always, without any sense of loss? Does it teach him that this giving is his joy and that God himself thanks him for his giving? That is the only environment in which you can be happy. You cannot make it, any more than you can make yourselves. It has been created for you, as you were created for it. God watches over his children and denies them nothing. Yet when they deny him they do not know this, because they deny themselves everything. You who could give the love of God to everything you see and touch and remember are literally denying heaven to yourselves. I call upon you again to remember that I have chosen you to teach the kingdom to the kingdom. There are no exceptions to this lesson because the lack of exceptions is the lesson. Every son who returns to the kingdom with this lesson in his heart has healed the sonship and given thanks to God. Everyone who learns this lesson has become the perfect teacher because he has learned it of the Holy Spirit, who wants to teach him everything he knows. When a mind has only light, it knows only light. Its own radiance shines all around it and extends out into the darkness of other minds, transforming them into majesty. The majesty of God is there for you to recognize and appreciate and know. Perceiving the majesty of God as your brother is to accept your own inheritance. God gives only equally. If you recognize his gift in anyone else, you have acknowledged what he has given you. 
nothing is so easy to perceive as truth. This is the perception which is immediate, clear and natural. You have trained yourselves not to see it and this has been very difficult for you. Out of your natural environment you may well ask, what is truth? Since truth is the environment by which and for which you were created. You do not know yourselves because you do not know your creator. You do not know your creations because you do not know your brothers, who created them with you. We said before that only the whole sonship is worthy to be co-creator with God because only the whole sonship can create like him. Whenever you heal a brother by recognizing his worth, you are acknowledging his power to create and yours. He cannot have lost what you recognize, and you must have the glory you see in him. He is a co-creator with God with you. Deny his creative power and you are denying yours and that of God who created you. You cannot deny part of truth. You do not know your creations because you do not know their creator. You do not know yourselves because you do not know yours. Your creations cannot establish your reality, any more than you can establish God's. But you can know both. Being is known by sharing. Because God shared his being with you, you can know him. But you must also know all he created, to know what they have shared. Without your father, you will not know your fatherhood. The kingdom of God includes all his sons and their children, who are like the sons as they are like the father. Know, then, the sons of God and you will know all creation.